Good evening and thank you for tuning in to Northern Beaches Council's Big Ideas Forum. Streaming live from Glen Street Theatre to your home or wherever you happen to be. My name is Will Rathall and I'm the team leader of community development at Northern Beaches Council. Warami, welcome. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet tonight and pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. This week is NAIDOC week and so I'd also like to acknowledge and recognise their continuing connection to care and knowledge of land, sea and sky for more than 65,000 years and to pay respects to their cultures, particularly tonight as we discuss the importance of community and building a greater sense of kinship in supporting children and families. Today is also Remembrance Day, commemorating the end of World War I and the lives of all those lost to war and the impact on their families and whole communities. Thank you also to the several local councillors tuning in tonight. Big Ideas is a quarterly forum engaging the local community in the robust exchange of ideas. We're here tonight to discuss all things children and families, referring to the renowned African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. It's a saying we've all heard a thousand times. But what does it mean in the 21st century, let alone in the age of COVID, when it's harder than ever to feel like we're a part of a community? Tonight's forum has been developed in partnership with the Northern Beaches Child and Family Interagency, a group made up of key services working to support local children and families. We'd like to acknowledge them and thank them for helping bring tonight together. Council's inaugural Big Ideas Forum hosted acclaimed social researcher Hugh Mackay to discuss the topic, Why Neighbourhoods Matter, in which he reminded us that the state of the nation begins in your street. Tonight's forum extends this idea on the importance of community to the early years of life, supporting both children and parents in a profoundly precious chapter. As a young father myself, I reckon we could well say that the state of the nation begins in the first few years of life. Tonight we have a stellar panel of child and family and community experts. Anne Hollands is a leading voice on the well-being of children and their families. She was director of the Australian Institute of Family Studies for five years before taking up the post of National Children's Commissioner with the Australian Human Rights Commission last Monday. Anne is a psychologist and former CEO of Relationships Australia and the Benevolent Society, with 30 years experience in research, policy and practice in social services, health and education for children and families. Welcome Anne. Kiwi-born Australian Jay Lagaya is a much-loved childhood educator and actor. His passion is early learning and he has worked on many iconic children's shows, including Play School, Jay's Jungle and Larry the Lawnmower. Jay is an internationally recognised actor, known for his roles on Home and Away, Daybreakers and of course Star Wars. He has worked alongside Natalie Portman, Jodie Foster and Sam Neill. Jay is also an acclaimed singer-songwriter and multi-instrumentalist with four ARIA-nominated albums. He has performed with his entire brood for the past three years at Carols in the Domain and also played lead roles in Jesus Christ Superstar, Disney's The Lion King and Wicked. Jay has lectured at Excelsior College for the past three years. He was the ambassador for Queensland Kindergarten from 2011 to 2017. Jay has eight children and three grandchildren. Welcome Jay. Clarence Brunsma is an Aboriginal Yagle person from the far north coast of New South Wales who has lived on the Northern Beaches for the past 10 years. As a community member, he puts community first and has led a number of volunteer programs and organisations supporting families and young people. Thanks, Clarence. Kerry Gwynn has been the manager of the Dalwood Spillstead Service for the past 15 years. With a background in occupational therapy, she has over 30 years experience in paediatrics and mental health. A public researcher, Kerry has received the New South Wales Health Award on three occasions for projects in service development and evaluation, as well as developmental screening. Kerry led the development of the Spillstead model of early years intervention and support for vulnerable families, including the first longitudinal study in Australia to follow up families 10 years post-intervention. The Dalwood Spillstead service is internationally renowned for its work with young children who have experienced trauma, abuse or disrupted development. Welcome Kerry. Thank you. We'll start with some prepared questions before opening up to questions from everyone participating in tonight's discussion. You can get, start getting your questions in at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll start with a few questions for Anne. 
So Anne, you're only a few weeks into your newly appointed position as the National Children's Commissioner. Congratulations. Thank you. Can you share a little bit about what that role involves and what you see to be your priorities? Okay, so the um, National Children's Commissioner is based, as you said in the intro, at the Hum Australian Human Rights Commission. So I'm one of a number of commissioners there, but my role is all about the kids. And, uh, and really it's about um, monitoring uh, what, how well our policies and our service system and our laws are working to promote the rights and well-being of children and their families who are caring for them. So uh, that's my brief, is to, for the next five years, keep an eye on that and to try and improve how we're um, trying to pull things together to, to improve the lives of, of kids. And having just started on Monday, I guess it's very <laughs> early days, obviously wishing you well. I'm not too sure at this stage if there are any emerging priorities that you, that you sense of or? I actually started Monday last week, but still, it's <laughs> very early days. Um, well, absolutely, uh, there are, there are ver some very clear priorities already emerging very quickly. Uh, so I can see that, um, and, and COVID has really amplified the, the situation. So where there's disadvantage and inequality, it's all been amplified this year. But there were pre-existing issues before COVID, obviously, that we, we all know about, the, that um, rising rates of mental health issues for kids. And, uh, and we know that some kids are doing it really hard, you know, First Nations children, um, um, overrepresented in, in um, out of home care and um, juvenile justice systems and despite all of our attempts in, in the past we haven't been able to make progress on that and I think that's a lot to do with the fact that we focus at a too low a level where we're not listening to communities enough to, to actually change the systems that wrap around families right across Australia. So, so my brief is actually is national. Mm. So I'm really looking at all, you know, education system, health system, social services, um, family law systems, all mental health systems, all of those systems that touch the lives of kids. And I, you know, I think that we, you know, we haven't been listening enough to what people say they need and how they want to be helped, including kids themselves. Mm. And, uh, and and so we haven't made that progress that we should have. Mm. And I think a country is, um, as prosperous as Australia, we can do, be doing a lot better for our most vulnerable children in particular. And you know what? One of the things I've really noticed in the last week, uh, as I've done uh, talkback radio and that kind of thing, I can hear already that I think the Australian public really wants things to change for the better. Mm. I think there is a real sense of momentum in this. We, you know, we... If, it breaks our collective hearts to see kids suffering in the way that we hear they are. And, and, and when we hear these news reports of a, a tragic incident or something terrible that happened, you know, we tweak the system here or there, but we kind of go from tragic incident to tragic incident. We've got to lift our gaze above, I think, and actually change, them, change things at a systems level. Mm. Thank you, Anne. Previous to your commissioner role, you were the director of the Australia Institute of Family Studies. What did you learn from your time there and what bearing does their research have on the topic tonight, focusing on the role of the community in supporting families? Well, I, I was such a privileged position to work with a hundred, you know, really smart researchers and uh, doing work uh, that is, is about building the evidence base to support the policies and the services we need for kids and families. And uh, I learnt many things. I learnt to value evidence. We, we need, what we need to do needs to be supported by evidence, always. Uh, and then we need to keep ensuring that we're building the evidence of what works. Uh, but most recently, we did some work at the Institute on how families were faring during COVID-19. Mm -hmm. It's a survey called uh, Families in Australia, Life During COVID. And, uh, and from that, we, we learned a lot about how people's lives have changed as a result of the huge disruption this year and what that's meant for them and how families have had to do all the pivoting to support each other and to, to get through this very, very difficult year. And again, we don't hear enough about that, really. Mm. Uh, we, you know, we hear about how, how government has had to pivot and how business has had to pivot, but I, I believe families are the ones that pivot the most 
always when the external environment changes. Can you share some of those changes? That... Well, for example, uh, just um, working from home. Uh, we were just chatting about that before, Clarence. Uh, Pre-COVID, this was a very large sample, uh, over 7,300 people na nationally during May and June. 7% um, said they worked from home before COVID, post the start of the pandemic, 60% working from home all of the time. Mm. So that's just a huge change and it really all happened overnight as we know. And it's meant that people have had to um, very much adjust how they live and work at home. And of course, we're homeschooling, caring for little ease when, when everything closed down. I know it's been really tough. Mm. Yep. Mm. And as we start tonight's discussion on It Takes a Village, what do you see as some of the key themes that we might want to explore tonight? Well, of course, we know there's a very strong body of research that shows that we all do better if we have uh, support around us, whether that be family or neighbours or friends. In fact, we need multiple layers of support. And those people who are close <coughs> to us they're actually more important in some ways than services. And I'm using, you know, mm. quotation marks here. We spend a lot of time talking about services and they are important. But um, when asked, uh, people will t tend to say, you know, 80% of them will say, where, you know, when you ask them, where do you turn for help if you have a problem? To family or friends. Okay, mm. and we understand that. We're no different. Uh, we want to go to someone we trust uh, and that, you know, we feel um, confidence in. Um, but of course, what we can do as family and friends is then help people to find professional services if they need it. So mm. a really um, specialist help that's, that is available, but often people don't know where to go mm. to get that help. But that front line, your first line of defence is your family and your friends and your, and your neighbours. Mm. Yep. Thank you, Anne. Jay, a few Hi. questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Play School has been on the air since 1966, so over 50 years. What do you think has made it so successful and what keeps it relevant to kids today? Oh, look, Play School is, is one of my first loves, I think because from a parent's point of view, you know you can leave the room for half an hour and your child will be educated, entertained and safe. Um, Play School is one of the rarities in, on, on television now in which we don't ask you to buy something to be part of our club. We grab toilet rolls and tissue papers, we stick them together and go, this is a butterfly. And we endow parents with that ability to become the teachers themselves, where their butterflies are as good as our butterflies. And they can then sing and dance around the room. Our job is to, to you know, as far as play school is concerned, is, is about sowing seeds uh, and about interaction. It's not about having a child sit there and letting us do everything. It's about asking questions, call and response. It's about teaching children about hand-eye coordination, head, shoulders, knees and toes. My favourite song is Twinkle Twinkle Little Star because it's, it's the um, Swiss army knife of songs. It not only teaches a child where stars are, up here, not down here, they twinkle and they sing, it's a hand-eye coordination, it teaches them how to sing um, not only so, it teaches them sonically what they're listening to uh, about communication between each other. It also teaches um, teachers about going, uh, children aren't here to judge you as a singer. They just want you to participate. And mm. I've had lots of educators who come and go, oh, mm. I don't dance, I don't sing because I'm not a really good singer. And I've, got, I've never had a three-year-old come to my show and go, <laughs> you know, you didn't hit that C really well. <laughs> and, you know, they just want you to participate. Yeah. And if you say no, then what's wrong? You know, mm. so from, I think, from play school's point of view, um, play school is an enabler. It allows children to play. It, it allows children to go on adventures without even leaving the room. Mm. But I think, for me, the biggest thing that play school has taught me is to play, is mm. to be able mm. to stop being an adult and find that in a four-year-old. Mm. We did discuss, actually, that we might be getting behind these chairs shortly to do some <laughs> puppetry. Um, <laughs> and my, my two-year-old daughter's favourite song is Daddy Finger uh, uh, by right. the Wiggles, of course. Uh, so, yeah. Now, you're a grandfather of three. Um, yes, as rub it in. well <laughs> as a father of eight. So I'm yes. assuming more are coming. You're clearly a busy man. How do you manage the balancing act of family and uh, busy schedule? Well, I've always said that my social media is a lot busier than I am. It's all about timing. Mm -hmm. um, but, look, you've got you've to answer the call. At the end of the day, as a parent... 
um, and that's what I am. You know, a lot of people look at you and go, you do this and you do that. Um, there are a lot of people who do amazing things like doctors and frontline nurses. You know, they do a lot more important things than I do, you know, but I happen to work in the public eye. Um, but as a, as a parent, you know, you've got to cover everything, shelter, you know, you've got to make sure that they're clothed, make sure they're loved. But, uh, um, you know, I, I try and keep myself as busy as I can, only so that I can stop my wife giving me more chores to do. Mm. But, you know, as I've grown older, I realise that um, it's about taking time to make time. It's about having conversations with my daughters in the car, mm. you know. Mm. It's about um, turning the television off and just having a chat over the, you know, over the table, over the dinner table. And sometimes it is very much about stopping everyone and going, we're going to sit at the table because everyone grazes now. Everyone Uber eats. Everyone, mm. you know, <laughs> it's like drive-by eating. Where are you going? Oh, I've got somewhere to go to. But so, you know, how do you stop that? You know, you say two nights a week, you know, this night and Sunday, uh, you all turn up. Mm. That's all I ask of you. And, you know, and, and so, yeah, slowly but surely, we're getting community back in my house. Yeah, <laughs> no, brilliant. Thank you. Um, uh, speaking of your, as your role as a grandfather, can you talk a little bit more about that and how it's different to being a father? Look, I think the, in Polynesia, we have extended families where our grandparents are part of the storytelling. They're always part of the narrative because um, I, I always say to, to grandparents or people who are grandparents, you know, we are there to support um, it, as much as we want to say, I told you, you know, we're there to support. But you also have to understand that you have done your, your, your teaching. You have done your support. Enjoy your old age. Because after a while, you know, there are people who go, oh, I've got your child here. And, I, you know, I just wanted to go out. I want to sleep, you know. And I think as a grandparent, my job is, is to tell my child all the stories, tell my grandchild all the stories about their children, you know, about my mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. What happened with them and why did they do this? Because sometimes they tend to forget why they do things or why dad says to do this, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and uh, um, my wife is really interesting in that uh, she's an educator. She's a uh, head of maths at, at Balmain High. And so she's very much that thing of, you know, the reason why children don't pick up stuff on the ground is because their peripheral vision, you know, isn't fully in, intact. So, you know, when you say pick up that, the clothes that, and the one next to your foot mm -hmm. and the one behind you, <laughs> you, you know, and she did this experiment with my kids where she just put headbands on them and then put blinkers on them, you mm -hmm. know, and then they put blinkers on me and go, right. And you spend most of your time going, Wait, oh, right, okay. And you realise that, you know, that child isn't greedy when they're playing on the football field. They just don't see the person next to them. Mm. So, you know, you know I, I love I being a, a grandparent because you can tell all your stories, you can impart all your wisdom on your child, um, and then you can give them back, you know, and you can watch them grow. Mm. Oh, thank you. I'd imagine we're going to have a lot more discussions around the role of extended families and, and change over time uh, in, in kind of Western raising of families. Um, the tonight's discussion is also going to be focusing on how we can actually be proactive in creating villages or a village mentality in our, in our local family or, or, or networks. Um, as, as a father and a grandfather, how, how do you create a sense of village or a village um, that supports you and your children and children's children? Oh, look, I look... You know, personally, and this is this is just me. Uh, I think society, um, <clears throat> I think society has too much say in how, ch how children are brought up. I think they have too much say in how families bring their children up. Uh, I think also there's this fear um, out there now. You know, where whereas common sense in the old days would be, if a child was climbing up a tree at a soccer game, mm. you know, you go, oi, get down. But there's this fear now, going, oh, that's not my child. So, I, mm. but. I'm still old school, you know, because at the end of the day, I would much prefer a parent saying, um, that's my son, you shouldn't speak to him like that, then do you know the number for the ambulance? Because mm. he's, bro you know, because as a parent, if mm. my child was climbing up there and I came down and they had broken their arm, I'd look at all the grown-ups and mm. go, what did you do? Yeah, you know, so yeah. I think, that's a good point. you know, for me, mm. it is it is always that thing of going, mm. how do you create community? It is very much about... Um, Inviting people that you don't, sitting and having conversations with people you don't know. How do you do that? Say mm. hi, introduce yourself. I mm. mean, COVID is really difficult at the moment, but it's also great because uh, I also lecture yeah. and my students uh, are, are traumatised to know that the same action that turns off their alarm also 
you know, um, puts, you know, uh, gets them into their Zoom class. You know, that action. <laughs> you know, so it's always this thing of, of being able to, mm. to talk to as many of them as they can. Uh, and I think, you know, as, as far as community is concerned, it is, you know, you, you've got to lead by example. It's always about, you know, um, you know the, the, the quality and, and the rubbish that you walk past is the rubbish that you will, you know, put up with. And so, uh, you know, I have to hold myself to a higher standard. Mm. Yep. Thank you, Jane. Clarence. Yeah, I will. Can you tell us a little bit about your work with Connected Mobs? Yeah. Um, mate, it's, um, I guess it's one of those things I've drawn out of um, actually one of my elders of the community, only Lois Burke, which I'm sure people in, you know, around the place might, not, might know of her, particularly down the Northern Beaches. And um, you know, she sort of mentioned how we need to get community back together, um, that we have this Aboriginal community in the Northern Beaches who very much, um, I guess, dis disconnected. Um, and that's just being... Uh, you walk past and I guess most people think, oh, well, what does an Aboriginal person look like? Well, you look at me, you know, you might say I'm actually South American rather than Aboriginal. And so, the, you know, we walk past each other not realising that how many Aboriginal people live in this space but actually don't know other Aboriginal people. So, you know, in Lois said, uh, we, we need to bring our mob together and we need to be able to share culture with each other. And when we're sharing culture, we're looking after each other because mm. our culture is about respect. It's about healing. It's about looking after Mother Earth. And, it's, and at the core found it, uh, core of all that is bringing up our young ones. And so, um, you know, I, I guess I was just an instrument of my aunties. Uh, he was, happens to be, um, you know, really close to my mother and, you know, they're born on the same day. Um, and, you know, she lives up the road and I've always had a profound respect for Annie Lois. But, you know, she's um, just using, I guess she used me as a tool to get some people together and my word of mouth and I guess maybe some of my motivation. Yeah. yeah so it's, um, it's been wonderful to just bring people together and, it's a really uh, informal opportunity where people come down to, we've been meeting at Narrabeen Lake, um, on a, you know, but generally on a fortnightly basis. COVID's changed a lot of that up. Um, but coming down, people bring their own plate of food and we share culture, talk story, share dance, sing song, um, get out our you know, boomerangs and throw some boomerangs around as we do, T teach our kids how to throw a boomerang, mm -hmm. uh, teach them how to weave. Uh, through all that, there's all story, there's all song and dance and all that has meaning around caring for country and caring for each other. Mm. And um, yeah, so mate, it's just, I'm, I'm just lucky enough to, to be a part of it, really, mm. yeah. Excellent, mm. well, that is great to hear. And obviously hearing about the role of sharing local cultural knowledge. Mm. Um, obviously, particularly focusing on families, how families benefit from being embedded in community. Can you talk mm. a little bit more about that? Well, um, oh, I, th I think the opportunity when lies, um, we're talking about neighbours and how, um, um, and you're referring to, you know, how your neighbour and your, your family and friends are, are sometimes your first point of call. Um, sometimes, I guess, for our Aboriginal families, uh, they're living off country. I'm, I'm a person who lives off country. I'm a Yagle fellow from the far north coast, living down here. Lucky enough, I knew my auntie Lois Burke, but only the other Aboriginal person I knew here on the northern beaches when I first came. And there's many other Aboriginal people in the same boat. And I guess one thing we as Aboriginal people really strive for is um, connection to our culture. And when you live off country, that's really hard to do. By, by having those connections with other Aboriginal people, other families who mean well and want to help you, it means that you've got a support network who's immediately around you. And, and, and when, when the chips are down and you're struggling, um, you know, we've had a number of different incidences throughout the community and times where just community come together by, by a cooking nightly meals for that family, coming in and painting the house, coming in and doing the cleaning or helping the ki just get the kids out of the house for the day. And, and that's just people who for maybe a year ago, six months or even a month ago didn't even know each other. Uh, but to then just move, um, you know, um, move heaven and hell to make sure that family mm. felt well and felt safe and felt loved and valued. And I guess, you know, that's the foreground of, you know, thinking about, talking about people like Marnie Lois Burke, um, Annie Claire Jackson, um, uh, Annie Carolyn Glass Patterson, mm. Annie, Annie Susan Moylan Coombs. You know, they've, they've really just been instrumental women in, in making, I guess, what community should look like and feel like. Mm. And I, f I really feel sometimes um, I, our First Nations people, I refer to you, Jay, you were talking about Polynesians. I think we, we, we're, it's really entrenched in, in our cultures that we get around each other. And no matter if, it, if you, I guess it's, you could be just that you're Aboriginal, we'll get around you and we'll support you. But it doesn't, doesn't stop there. If you want to be a part of our community and you're an Aboriginal person, you're more than welcome to come be a part of that and we'll help you just as much. But I think it's something we as, as a society can really um, bring in and really use and, yeah. and, and, and enjoy. And, and really, I guess at this point during COVID, um, really could um, in, in embellish into you know, our own healing. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, thank you. Mm. 
And um, just one, one oh, final question uh, about how, how is culture significant to community and identity? Um, so I guess I was sort of talking on before, but um, I guess, so culture, um, culture when you're talking Aboriginal terminology, I guess it, it's really broad. It's song, it's dance, um, but it, it's connection to country, it's, uh, it's, it's place, um, because when you talk about song, um, when you talk about dance, when you talk about those stories, they're connected to a place and, and also a time. But each one of those, um, I, I, they, they teach you values in life. And unlike, um, I guess, uh, not, not too dissimilar, sorry, I should say, into what you might say, I guess, the Ten Commandments within the Bible, it's really just ways of living, ways of being healthy with each other, ways of being healthy with, 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 um, within community and connecting into country. Yeah. And so, I guess, culture for, for us as Aboriginal people is everything. Yeah. Um, when you have the opportunity to connect with culture and, and, you, and I guess as a, as a person, it really fills your heart, it really fills your stomach and you, and you feel um, wholesome. Yeah. Uh, we, we long to be back at home on country, but as well by having those great connections to this country and where you live and with the Aboriginal people around you, it can also make you feel really wholesome. So mm. the mm. culture for us is, mate, is uh, second to none mm. yeah, in terms mm. of our health and our yeah. well-being. Yeah, yeah. Mm. No, cheers, Clarence. I look forward to exploring a bit further. Mm -hmm. Kerry, <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about the Dalwood Spillstead service and its unique model of early years intervention? Oh, thanks so much. Great. Well, it was great to be here. And I, I guess the thing about our service is that it is unique. Um, we And we only really exist because of the incredible community support we get through the Northern Beaches people. Uh, we sit on that site at Dalwood and we're really the evolution of the old Dalwood's homes, which was all charitably funded. And I think that support has given us the opportunity to, pr to develop a model where we can really help families who need that extra intensive support. Mm. Most of the families are referred to us by professionals when they're saying that this family needs more than what mainstream education, mainstream health and those mainstream welfare services can offer. Uh, and, uh, you know, commonly they'll be families who are very isolated mm. in their community, so mostly single parents, mostly parents who are dealing with their own mental health issues or recovering from addiction or, you know, family violence and dealing with stress. Mm that is really hard to manage as a parent. And what we, what we do is we try to focus on supporting families who have young children because we know there's a double whammy, isn't there? It's really a hard time to be a parent when you've got little ones in the early years, but it's such a crucial time for the kids, mm. isn't mm. it? It's so important for all areas of their development, but what we know is particularly their emotional resilience. Uh, and we've been really fortunate, you know, because we've got that community support. I guess one of the things about sitting there at Dalwood in a nice facility is in a great community is we always felt there was a, a sense of obligation to be able to be doing things really well. And so what we have did is just look around the world at where are those, as Han said, those really evidence-based practices? Where are those approaches that are used that are best practice and what we tried to do is look at them all and integrate them into the one place and I guess the model we've developed that's you know we've been really thrilled as we've researched and demonstrated works and that we've got some interest for in Australia and overseas is basically a village model mm. which I think is really on topic here tonight and mm. and it's very relational and all we've done is create this one-stop shop mm. we've provide as many services for both parents and children from the one team. I have to tell you, when we first set that up, everyone said that was never going to work. Mm. You know, and you'd imagine that the expertise needed to work with adults might be really different from the expertise needed to work with very small children. But, um, oh my goodness, it works. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you can imagine, it works for lots of reasons. I think the first one is, you know, we're dealing with families who are in a hell of a lot of stress. If you want to reduce stress, you want to make it easy to find help. Mm. <laughs> Finding help can be stressful. You know, anybody who's looked for a new dentist mm. knows how hard it is. Where do I go? Who do I start with? And, you know, when you're stressed... Hairdresser. Hairdresser. <laughs> good work. Eh? You know, meeting new people, dealing with intake systems, 
dealing with new professionals, mm. it all adds stress. It doesn't reduce stress. As and especially, said, I guess, those with shame or stigma of being attached to it as well. Mm. All um, of that, mm. all of that. So we just find if you can do as much as possible in the one place, and they mm. know there's a one place they go to, um, then it just makes it so much easier. It mm. makes it easier to ask for help. You know, and as Anne said, we all turn to our families, but there are times you need that extra mm. help. And mm. it the second thing that I think is really remarkable that needs to be researched is how when you, when the family is working with the same group of people all the time, and I think this really fits with that model of community, and that group of people are skilled enough and knowledgeable enough to know how to, how to offer real, unconditional, consistent, predictable care, uh, there's a lot of healing mm. in that environment. If you feel that you're accepted, if you feel that you're not being judged, and I think a lot of places call it kind of containment or co-regulation, if you like, and, mm. and we just find that that, that um, in itself creates a huge amount of support. And then once you feel that you can manage in that setting, of course, the next thing for us is to connect into community, into work, into study, into the local the local settings that mm. are going to be there. Mm. Um, you know, when the child, we always say, who's going to be at the 25th birthday party? Mm. Who's going to be there with that child when they're older to hold them as they go to their graduation. Mm. We're really thrilled we've been able to do this research and um, we think we've got, and we're about to publish this first longitudinal study of a group of families <coughs> we worked with 10 years ago. And you can imagine how scary it was. We worked with them when they were, the kids were three to five years of old and we're following them up in adolescence. Mm. Mm. And uh, a bit frightening because you think, well, adolescence is, an, is another time where stress is rife and you, you could imagine there might be deterioration. And, mm -hmm. and what we found was just a remarkable, sustained change. So we had kids that came to us when they were three to five who had diagnoses of ADHD, behaviour disorder, um, developmental delay. They left us doing well, but, even, but still in adolescence, 75% of that group were functioning without any need for any support. Mm. And in adolescence, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I'd have to say we're remarkable. So we've got a mission. Yep. We feel a bit of a mission now we've done this study to say, well, I think that we're on the right track. This is evidence-based. It's evidence-based in neuroscience. Um, it's evidence-based in terms of the relational support and uh, we're keen to spread mm. the word about mm. this approach. The other thing I think I'll finish with is really, help, really important too, is we're cheap. We've been able to demonstrate that we can provide more services and have better outcomes for kids mm. for less money. Mm. So, well, you know, that's that. really interesting. <laughs> and and Kerry here and together and on this yeah, discussion. That surprised, that surprised me, yeah. me. But, you know, when you do things in a holistic way, everybody thinks that's it's going great. to be expensive. And mm. I remember years ago, someone said we were the Rolls-Royce model in the Northern Beaches. And, yep. and so that's been our mission to prove that actually we're mm. cheaper. Mm. It's about critical mass and yep. <laughs> that yep. kind of thing, yep. which... We can't Fantastic. go to, but and we can interesting find that long, stuff. longitudinal studies out there in the public domain not now. Not yet, yeah, not yet. So we're, when, we're, when, yeah, we're, pu we're publishing that soon. I think it'll be really interesting. Okay, we look forward yeah. to posting that on the council Thanks, website when, when time Ooh. comes. And um, no, I was just going to ask you a little bit about mm. the, the you referred to I think previously in our discussions around the neurological imperative of positive relationships. Could oh, you could cool. you share a little bit more about that? That's a nice discussion around. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think, you know, one of the things, and it's so lovely listening to Clarence, isn't it? You know, one of the things that's really interesting now is that we have such great scientific knowledge, don't we? We know what works best for human beings. We know how we need to be edified in a relational way. And the bizarre thing is that our culture has moved in the opposite direction. And when it comes to children, what we know is, you know, in our evolutionary period and traditional communities know this so well, you know, we were designed to be in communities where there was an, one child for every four adults. Doesn't work that way now though, does it? And But more and more over the years, our families, our systems, our childcare centres have become more nuclear and more isolated and we're just heading in the wrong direction. Mm. Uh, and, and, you know, I think even the use of devices and things like that are probably isolating us even more and more. So mm. what we know is that children need, and the wonderful, there's a wonderful child development 
uh, theorist Yuri Broffenbrenner, who talks about the fact that children need irrational relationships with adults. Mm. They need adults who just are crazy about the kid. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and, you know, when you think about hopefully in your childhood or in your children's childhood, they will have a handful of adults that are just love them to bits. Yep. Mm. You know, it, hopefully it's two parents. Ho hopefully there's a grandparent around, maybe an aunt and uncle, but there could be a friend of dad or mum, there could be a coach. You know, that kind of grandparent that has their favourite vase, the two-year-old knocks over the vase and everyone goes, oh, granny's got it. And the grandparent says, oh, well, it was just a vase. Yeah. <laughs> because that two-year-old that they're crazy about, that they're really in love with, can do no wrong at mm. that level. Um, and, I, and I think the challenge for us in our communities is so many of the kids we're working with, being a single-parent households, Parents who are dealing with their own early childhood trauma and are not connected with the community, there's so much disadvantage and lack of connection for those kids. Mm. They, they may have one adult. And so what we need to do is think about how we can connect those kids mm. with more adults that will stay in their lives for the long term and take that interest in them. And, and I think neuroscience is telling us how a little bit can go a long way. Mm. You know, it's fabulous to hear that just a little bit of interest in that child next door who has a single mum who may not be able to afford a holiday, your family's going on a camping trip, you invite them to go, that's going to be a powerful life-changing experience for that child. You know, that, that single mum or dad who can't afford the soccer fees, you pay the soccer fees for them. You, they don't have transport, you take them there and back if it's a friend of your child that has a powerful impact on that child. So I think we need to let people know mm. that a little bit of reaching out, involving that child that you know might be less connected with their community. You know, we're looking to nippers, doing some scholarships for kids. You know how expensive mm. to join nippers? Mm. And a lot of the kids we work with never get to the beach. And how sad is that in mm. this community? So there's a lot we can do. Um, and I, I think, as Jay said, sometimes we're, we get fearful, don't we, of butting into someone's business or mm. maybe doing something that seems inappropriate. We don't need to be worried about that. We need good people there to just reach out that little bit more mm, excellent. to those kids in need. Yep. Yeah. No, thank you, Kerry. I think that's primed up our discussion very well. I'm sure we've got some questions coming through live here as well. Cool. Um, so much more to explore. We'll move through to some audience questions. Um, remember, you can submit a question at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. To kick off our audience questions tonight, we have a question from Nicole from Northern Beaches Mums. Northern Beaches Mums' mission is to support young families by linking them in with local networks, services and supports in an accessible format. You can find them by searching for Northern Beaches Mums on Facebook. Nicole's question is, since COVID, Families rely on the internet to socialise and connect more than ever. Does a village have to be a physical space? What is the role for online communities like ours? I'm, I'm, I'm looking left and right, thinking who I'm going to pitch that to. Um, gosh, Anne, would you like to kick us off? Well, hi, Nicole. Uh, thank you for the question. It's a really good question because mm. really we have to accept that the online world we all live in the online world now. We do and our kids do and uh, it is part of our lives. So it's not a one or the other. But I think, uh, you know, I think we do know enough about the brain now to know that we are wired for mm. this kind of contact. And by the way, it's very exciting to be out mm -hmm. in, right. in, with real people, not, yeah. not, Socially on, distanced. <laughs> not on the screen. I do a lot of my work on the screen these days. Um, but that we, you know, as humans, that's how we are wired. And so that is important. So, Nicole, I would say that it's both. Mm. You know, you, <coughs> the online community is important for helping people know how to reach each other, but then to have some face-to-face -face mm. contact as well. Excuse me. Mm. No, no. I know my <laughs> wife's on Northern Beaches Mum, so thank you, Nicole, yeah. for what you're doing with that group. It's incredibly popular, and I know she finds it incredibly useful in terms of accessing information. Uh, particularly for you know our, our two young girls, it goes a long way. So she doesn't engage individually with people, but the access to the information is critical. 
um, and I guess it's been for her, it's been connecting through the, the mums groups, through the local health centres and hospitals, that's been the yeah. really best face-to-face -face, yeah. um, operation. Yeah. And I'm obviously envious <coughs> as a man to think, where's the, where's the father's groups? Oh. You know, um, I, was, I remember when I had little kids, and um, so I'm a mum and a grandmum now to Jake. Rock on. Yeah, rock on. <laughs> <laughs> totally with you, brother. Um, uh, but I, I was very lonely. You know, uh, yeah. and I'm, you know, from the northern beaches, and mm. I, I remember feeling really, really isolated. Um, and then now my daughter has had two little boys, and uh, and so she's connected as well online. And and you know, I think it can really, really help. So the what the work that Nicole and her group are doing is really valuable. I think mm. it's really mm. interesting mm. because uh, you you bring up I I came over in '95 to work on a. <clears throat> uh, Channel 9 show, uh, Water Rats, and my wife brought her young, two young children with her. We didn't know anyone. Um, they joined a play group, hmm. and she said she was sitting there with, playing with the children, and one woman approached her, introduced herself, they sat down, had it, and then the next day they saw each other and they had this chat, had a coffee, and then she introduced her to her inner circle. 25 years on, I'm emceeing that child's wedding. Oh, you know, wow. it's, it, you know it, it's <laughs> the importance of, of that. And yeah. to answer Nicole's yeah. question, personally, um, uh, it for me, it has to be a physical space uh, as far as the village is concerned. Online is great when you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation, yeah. but fr from, a, from a child's point of view, it also has to be tactile because that's part of the senses that they use. Yep. I always look at online being a wallpaper you know, um, that it's it's background noise as such. And also it has to be limited because children are quite happy to, to, to disappear into that void mm. and let other people entertain them instead yeah. of them um, mm. discovering how things work, you know. So, you know, every now and again, I, I find when I go visiting preschools and that, I'll sit down with a box of Lego and then we'll all have this conversation about people that I don't know, because Johnny said that, you know, oh, so how is Johnny? He's good, you know. <laughs> I have no idea who these are. But, you know, it, it's about, you know, creating this conversation. And and, uh, and I think that, you know, that you're right in that these, these groups that form, you know, it is about, you know, um, reaching out to those who are lonely or who, you know, have not yet been introduced. Mm -hmm. You know, that's mm -hmm. what I love about the idea, you know. And once you open up and have a, conversation about your child something that we all know all of a sudden it's about my child has this cough does anyone know? oh yeah he my child had a rash like that well you've got to mm. do this and you've got to do that but also seek medical help which is always great mm. 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 Yeah. our next question is a video question from northern beaches young citizen of the year and local environmental campaigner 11 year old dia mcnamara hi my name is dia mcnamara and this year I had the honour of being the Young Citizen of the Year for the Northern Beaches. I love being part of the Northern Beaches community. It is a community that is very conscious of environmental issues, a subject I care about a lot. How can encouraging people to get involved in environmental initiatives connect children and their families with their communities? Oh, well, thank you, <coughs> Dia. Thank you for that question. Mm -hmm. And I might um, put that over to Clarence even at first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, thanks, Will. Um, and thank you, Dia. Uh, great question. Um, you know, uh, environment. Um, when we when we talk about environment as Aboriginal people, that's that's mother. That's that's where we're linked to. That's where we're born from. Um, so when we think about caring for the environment, we're caring for mother. And when you're caring for mother, you're also caring for all our totemic, I guess, creatures and animals um, and, and and plants that are that are connected to us um, and our beliefs. But um, how, how do we how do we uh, I guess build that village or those the community connections through? Um, looking after the environment, the, um, I really feel and I see a real opportunity in the community gardens and it's something that mm -hmm. um, I really wanted to push mm -hmm. in our little area within the, in the Narrabeen area that you know, I guess through, we know through having your hands in the soil, the, the, the mental um, um, benefits from just having your hands, but as well as the nutrients you actually gain from playing in the soil yourself. Mm -hmm. We also know, I guess, you, you, you do get um, there's germs, etc. but those germs can be healthy for your mm -hmm. own development. So mm -hmm. by, by placing your hands in the soil, putting a plant in the ground, the, you also have that sense of, I guess, um, of positive, um, positive self that you're giving back to something that mm -hmm. isn't you. But as well as you also have the great conversations of other people around you. And 
you can have, have, I guess, a great interaction without even having to speak with people around you by just putting plants in the ground and, and, and shifting soil and mm. you know, sometimes finding a worm and screaming if, you, if it's, it's something you're scared of. But, uh, <coughs> but I, I see community gardens. Um, you know, they're, they're, I know there's the um, Northern Beaches Cleanup. That, you know, there's, there's a quite a few different groups across the mm. Northern Beaches where real yeah. opportunities you can connect in with people. And you know, I've just seen like uh, on the Facebook page, the Northern Beaches Cleanup, they look like they're having a fun time. Um, yeah. it's, it's something that we us within the connected mobs, uh, we've talked about with the youth there that uh, we will find an opportunity to go and join um, that, that, that group and, and do it ourselves because giving back to mother and looking by, by cleaning the rubbish off, you know, off our beaches and uh, within our lakes and uh, around our um, environment, well, we're helping mother, which is, our, which is really a belief of our culture, but it's also a great opportunity we can be looking after each other. And, yeah, mm. so. I think, yeah, community gardens and, and we're opportunities to, you know, be cleaning up and putting plants back in the mm. soil. Mm. Mm. Oh, brilliant. And actually maybe a question for Dia as well, but Connected Mobs, what's the age group uh, in terms of uh, participants and, and people? Yeah, so Conne it? Connected Mobs Greater um, is, is focused at, at all ages. Um, we're looking at, um, you know, mums and, you know, we're talking about mums and bubs, but, you know, it's people who I guess have single and, and fathers who also have um, uh, are single parent fathers. Um, but as well as we've got our um, older generation who are great grandparents, and mm. so it's uh, it's all ages. And the idea is that I guess through that, what happens is is everyone is connecting. Um, we've got, you know, we had a beautiful incident um, where there's one young lass um, who is here living in, in um, off country in um, a boarding house, and she was sitting right next to her uncle, which she'd never met. And her uncle grew up with her father in the same community where she was from. But however, the uncle hasn't been back there for a fair while. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they just had never connected. And then we're doing introductions around, you know, we're, we're, you know people might say yarning circle, but we're just, just connecting. And uh, she goes, oh, I'm from uh, X community. And then he looks down and he's going, you're not such and such's daughter, are you? <laughs> and then suddenly they're connected and they're having a conversation about, yeah. and they sat there for half an hour next to each other but hadn't made those connections. Wow. And once that happened, well, then she knows automatically she's got a support person yeah. Who, yeah. Who, yeah. who values yeah. her and her family. So, so um, nice. it's, it's really open and broad. We also do have um, youth group, which runs at the PCYC, and we're really fortunate mm -hmm. that PCYC mm -hmm. give us a space to, to allow for those young, young people to come in. And that's focused at um, 11 through to 18. And the part yeah. about that, I guess, is, is not having the really young there is, is just, I guess, some of the activities we do, running around, playing basketball and... and touch football and soccer. Um, if we have the real young lilies, we do have lilies come along at times on special times, but uh, quite often it, it's looking at that. Those teenage years when, when life, and as I guess you were alluding to before, Kerry, that first teenage years, it just, just stress and just, no, no, they're looking for someone. Mm. And so mm. I think if we can connect around that 11, 12, they, have, they mm. know they build some mentors, build some relationships. So mm. when things get tough, they've got mm. people to mm. lean on mm. and they've mm. developed it before it's gotten tough. Yeah, mm. yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. No, wonderful. Thank you. And it's a great picture, isn't it? Like we we're talking previously about uh, extended families and multi generational setups, so that you've got that real sense there through, through that gathering of, mm. of the generations sitting along, side by side with each other. Yeah. And, and taking something that happens less these days. Yeah, yeah. And, and taking up that message that you're talking about, at the end of the day, how do you become a community? Or it's about parents teaching their children about, you know, um, putting rubbish away, about recycling, about using this mm. instead of that, you know, because we are the ones that have to teach you that, that, you know, it is about Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. It is about, um, you know, when you walk and there's rubbish on the ground, it's stopping to pick that up. Because, mm -hmm. you know, the idea of someone will pick that up mm -hmm. just means that no one's going to pick that up. And if mm -hmm. you make a difference by just picking this up, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, you'll, you know, because children don't learn, you know, um, they imitate. Mm -hmm. So when you start, you know, if there are things that are great about, you know, your child, that's you. If, there are things mm -hmm. that are not, you know, that aren't great about your child. That's your wife. And, they, you know, and kids, you know, so little kids especially, learn in the context of a relationship yes, with you. Yeah. So it is yeah. about that relationship, that human contact again. Mm -hmm. That's where they're learning. That's how their brain develops, is mm -hmm. in a relationship mm -hmm. with you mm -hmm. every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All of those little small interactions every day. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Our next question um, is, are you happy with the emphasis placed in schools on academic progress? And should we be doing more to support students' well-being? Let's start with Kerry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, great. I didn't have a name to that yeah, question, not too but sure. it's that that it, right. such an insightful question, isn't it? I think you know I'm not an educator, but and I or I just am in awe of educators because I'm aware of how much they try to cover in schools. Um, I think it, you know the only thing that you can say is it's just got to be a balance, doesn't it? 
we, you know, and again, we're talking, Anne and I keep talking about brain research, you know, the fascinating thing that we know now about learning is that it's got to be fun. It's got to be motivating. If kids are feeling pressured to perform academically, they won't retain it. And so all learning environments need to be, need to have a lot of TLC because people learn better, as Anne was saying, when they're in relationship, when they feel that they've got support around them and it's okay to make a mistake, etc. cetera. Um, they learn better when it's their idea, mm. when they're, it, they're in control and they're motivated about the subject. And then they also learn when it's fun. And the, the, two, the two first things really make it fun, don't they? The fact that they feel comfortable with the relationships around them and that it's what they want to learn. So, you know, what we can do to promote learning is to make sure that we've got those, we are looking after their emotional well-being. So I think mm. the two are so tied together mm. Mm -hmm. that we, to get it right, um, you know, you've got to start from the bottom up with how emotionally comfortable and supported does that child feel in the school setting? How motivated are they to learn? Uh, and then the academics will just mm. flow because mm. they'll be working at their best. I think, can I just say though that I think, and particularly now with the economic downturn, oh. a lot of, mm. we as parents, we're very worried about the future for our yeah. kids and, uh, and you know, the financial future for ourselves or f and for our kids. Yeah, and so I think yeah. that there's a lot of anxiety for parents and, and so mm. I think parents can find themselves sort of really wanting the school to to kind of push their kids mm. to achieve because of that anxiety about the future. And so, you know, we can, we can get on this sort of train that's going in that direction and it's hard to get off and to go, actually, you know, kids need a whole lot of things, not just that academic pressure. And I know, mm. because I've heard parents talking about mm. it, even in just the last week, about how um, so many kids are being in high school, latter years of high school, being diagnosed with anxiety and depression and that these rates are going up. Uh, and uh, and I, so I think that together with other parents and with the school, I think maybe we need to do a bit of a reset mm. and go, okay, mm. yes, the future is important for our kids, but they're, they're, they're in, yeah. today is important. Yeah. Their yeah. well-being today. And their today, well-being is important. Yeah. Right? They deserve yeah. a really good childhood yes, today. Exactly. So it's about get, re resetting that sort of time uh, the thinking about the future versus the mm. present for mm. kids. Mm. And I remember in Absolutely. previous discussions we've had around schools and, and trying to connect uh, young people and parents to services. We talked a little bit about the, the notion of getting more services in schools. Oh, yeah. and I, could you yeah. talk a little bit more about oh, that? Oh, well, yeah, look, this is a bit of a hobby horse of mine. Um, so I know that in other parts of the world that uh, are doing um, better than Australia is in, on, on many of these things, they actually integrate their health services in with the education yeah. services so that they're, you know, like in the grounds of a school, there will be um, a family health service. And so we know that for the people that really need help, they're the ones that are least likely to get the help because of the fear of shame or stigma for saying, I need help, right? But if, but you know, everyone goes to school, everyone goes to the GP or goes to a health service, there's no shame mm. or stigma in visiting one of those places mm. and put them together. And, and I think there's a whole lot that you could do by um, uh, uh, making the services easy to reach for mm. the people who need it the most. It's, it's a strange thing Absolutely. because, I mean, uh, growing up in New Zealand, we had a dentist at school. We had a dental yeah. clinic that was at school where all the kids would go, everyone would go through, and it was probably the, the only time, because, you know, uh, um, those who couldn't afford a dentist mm. would, would go through, uh, you know, you remember... The, you know, those things, those little white buds you put in your mouth would turn into bumblebees and hanging all over the place. But, you know, uh, it, that was the norm for us. And then yeah. it disappeared because, you know, people had ulterior motives as such. And I, and I do agree that the idea of, you know, the, the problem with, with schools is simply that, you know, you've got a, a horse and a snake and a stick and a, you know, and a kangaroo and they're all lined up and school goes, I want you to get to the end. First one there wins. It's not, it doesn't cater for everyone. You know, mm -hmm. in America, they teach driving, you know, at, at schools. You know, why don't they do it here? Because mm -hmm. our kids have to learn to drive. Why don't they do it collectively so that, mm -hmm. you know, it takes the pressure off parents. So I think, you know, I think 
there has to be a balance, especially with well-being, especially with with uh, uh, suicide in schools mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I've always had discussions, I've had discussions when working as the ambassador of Queensland Kindergartens for many years, had discussions with learned people yeah. about what would it be like if we had professors and that teaching preschoolers? Because, mm -hmm. you know, uh, between the years of, you know, zero to five, that's when their synaptic pathways are being, you know, knitted together. That's <laughs> when they're learning everything. Because after five, after six years old, then they're just doing things by rote, you know. Uh, and they said, what would happen if we, we got all of the most brainiest people to teach our young? You know, because they, they are the ones that will just, you know, they would grab it all, they would absorb it all, they would learn it all. You know, at the moment we've got it back to front. When parents are worried about their children sitting in their HSC and going to universities, the end of their education, when we should be really focusing on the beginning of that because if we look after the foundation, mm. the house will be solid. But, Jay, yeah. you, you make it more fun than any professor <laughs> would. And, and, you know, when they're little, they, they learn through play, play. Yeah. right? Yeah. And, yes, you're right, the brain is developing. Yeah. like It's pretty much developed by the age of five, yeah. right? Mm. Mm. It's all, all, mm. all the connections are there. But a lot of it is play-based that mm. they need to be doing mm. in those years and to set them mm. up mm. for mm. when they go to big school. Mm. It's mm. all got to happen in those early years. Mm. If it hasn't been done already, we can definitely make you an honour if we don't mind me uh, jumping in, I, uh, my, my, so my background, um, I'm actually head teacher of wellbeing. Yes. <laughs> is my substantive position uh, within within the school, and um, uh, the, the, some of the troubles I guess we do have is that we, our our curriculums are so heavily dense with so much content to teach mm. about mm. That, the, that I guess you've sometimes got to get through so much content yeah. mm. and try so and teach it well. Yeah. Um, you know, thinking about and acknowledging mm. teachers this year in. COVID, how they've had mm. to change in the way they're delivered in a matter of mm. a couple of weeks, Amazing. go online, yeah. and then a couple of weeks later be told that, uh, or we'll <laughs> do three months of teaching, and then within a couple yeah. of weeks, you're going back to the classroom yeah. after yeah. you've done all this preparing, yeah. preparing <laughs> and now trying to help kids finish their tours. So, you know, big yeah. acknowledgements for teachers you know, this oh, year yeah. in schools. They've totally. done a Absolutely. massive... Um, and, yeah, and, totally. and children have come back in a really vulnerable state at the current yeah. moment, and we're seeing yeah. it in schools. But, um, you know, certainly, I guess... Trying to find that even balance mm. is a real tricky thing, yeah. um, and you know, quite often, I guess it's it's what's coming from the home life into the school that really impacts a child. And you know, mm. sometimes it could be just even the first meal of the day. You know, I've seen young young boys and girls rock into school with a can of mother in their hand and a bag full of lollies. Mm. And, and mm. I guess you know, when you when you're talking mm. about, I guess role modelling, Jay, before you know, I guess mm. how you, you, you what you see um, really. So you know, what opportunity, I guess, is there for that? first other day for that child to get just the, mm. that meal they need in their stomach that's going to give them sustained energy mm, yep. so when they engage in their first lesson they're just as engaged in their first lesson as they are in the third and fourth mm. of the day mm. and not just on you know here in 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 period one mm. and by the by after lunch yeah. they're down here and they they're you're struggling to keep them engaged mm. um or they're quite angry and upset because they've just had they've gone from a high down to a mm. massive sugar yeah. low yeah, 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 yeah so yeah. you know the, the, i guess there's a a number of different things to look at. It's a really tricky balance. Yeah. It's so hard for Jade. And we finished just with a plug yeah. that the best research in terms of education is about early childhood education. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 uh, the, the jury's back in there. And so, you know, good investment in great quality mm -hmm. early mm -hmm. childhood education mm -hmm. just sets kids up for life. And mm -hmm. we're, we're yet to kind of really tackle that one, I think, well. Mm -hmm. We're doing better and better, but it'd be great to see more, I think, focused in that. And mm -hmm. that would just then make kids more ready mm. to for that learning experience it's that's about for sure it's also about you know educating the public that a preschool teacher yes. is not a babysitter Correct. but that's they're all exactly they're right, educated Jay. people who choose to do this for a living <laughs> you know and you yeah. know i've had preschool teachers who have said you know that you know they, they've had my children more than i do they, they yeah. see them more than i do they they teach them about stuff and and one woman said something really prophetic she said um the reason why this child plays up is because it's the first time they've heard no. You know, parents um. have stopped parenting and now they're expecting teachers to parent, whereas teachers should be teaching. And you were talking about, you know, adjusting programs. My wife, you know, had to do that. All of a sudden mm. you're going online, you know, mm. make up this, this program for all, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten, all those years. And so they have to do that. Not only do they have to do that, which is hours upon hours upon hours, they don't get paid for it. You know, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's mm -hmm. the thing. So, you know, in the end, I think the message is, you know, if 
you've got to invest in, in, in our young people. You've got to invest in our, our teachers mm. because they're the ones that are you know growing our future. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm. Take mm. those absolutely. points on board. Now, we have another video <coughs> question here. So this time we're going to hear from Michelle Pober, who works for the Family Referral Service. Thanks, Michelle. Good evening. I am Michelle Pober and I work for the Family Referral Service. We link families with a child and young person under the age of 24 years old or women who are pregnant to support services such as family support teams, counselling, housing services and much, much more. We can support people over the phone or face to face. My question tonight to the panel is what do you think is the most important thing a community member can do to give children the sense that they belong and matter in the community? Thank you. Good night. Thank mm. you, Michelle. The most important thing. Mm. There we go. I might want to hear it's a very short snippet from all of us, really. I don't know, Jay, do you want to, want to hear a few um, things from yourself? Oh, look, that, it's, a, it's a broad question. For me, it's about sm smile. You know, it's mm. the thing of going, if you have a welcoming facade, uh, it allows a child to, you know, not to fear you, um, that you are open to have a conversation, mm. you're open to approach. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Many things can start from a smile. Thank you. Any mm. other thoughts there, Kerry? Well, I think, you know, the thing that comes to my mind is, well, we're, we're all so busy now, aren't we? Mm. And uh, I, I wonder whether we, we need to slow down a bit more and mm. sit down with kids. And I know what makes a real difference to all of us, and particularly to kids, is just noticing them, mm. noticing what they're interested in, noticing what they're doing, giving them that warm, relational... Mm. smile and interest and mm. uh, you know I, I think we could sort of <clears throat> do a lot more of that and kids mm. just lap it up I mean let's think every child wants to be look at me don't they just mm. taking that interest stopping for five ten minutes to sit down and notice what they're doing with their blocks or notice what they're doing with their homework mm. is really edifying for any child mm. yeah oh thanks my smile oh. answer was just ridiculous now no, 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 that's, that's a big part of it that's that's what you're saying notice and smile no, I'm yeah. Yeah. and i'm extending it yeah. i'm just yeah. i'm yeah. i'm, yeah. I'm yeah. agreeing yeah. with you <laughs> absolutely well i mean i just agree that and it just reminds me of you know the joy of being a grandparent again I, yeah. and when when my first grandson was born at some stage i worked out actually I don't have anything else to do. I can just sit. I oh, know. I can just sit and wonderful. listen and, you know, hang hang out with this kid. Yeah. And that's the magic of the grandparent. Yeah. But but that you can also do that as a neighbour or a friend mm. or it doesn't have to be a grandparent. Mm. But it is having taking the time to listen to actually mm. listen mm. to mm. kids and try and, and understand them, even when they're their language you know, they may not be very lit uh, verbal yet, mm. but Actually, if you listen to them, you can work out a, a lot of what's going on mm. in, in terms of their own communication mm. when they're mm. little. Mm. Mm. Yep. Jay, I, th I think what you said, smiley may is brilliant. Right. Yeah. 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 Because it's the beginning start of all the, all the rest all of the stuff that happens. That's exactly you know, right. I guess a child needs to engage, want to yeah. engage with you. So, Thank mate, you, brother. Yeah. 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 I'm not sure there are many studies we can cite about the importance of smiling. I'll go for your hug later, A smile makes you feel better too. Yeah. Research on that. It helps us all. It increases your face value. And that kindness, you know, showing that kindness in your in your smile, right? You're a kind person. But um, I guess on another note there, Will, I guess it's, you know, as, as the children start to grow, um, taking on those roles of being a mentor mm. and, and, yes. and knowing that you mm. are a role model, mm. um, where I guess you never know that you might be a mentor to someone mm. else until mm. maybe later in life. Mm -hmm. And it could yeah. be just one conversation. It could have been 10 conversations that you had with them where you've told them a thousand times not to do something, but it didn't click until the 10th mm. time. But mm. I think, you know, sometimes just, as I think, you know, as you're saying, Jay, you know, t um, s give them the smile, make them feel valued, um, you know, and, um, you know, and, and Kerry sitting down and listening, you know, those are all the things, I guess, that start to build that mm. role model and that mentoring relationship. So mm. when mm. you can, you know, but I guess it's that they can start at a very young age or it can mm. be that those older years yeah. and, mm. and then knowing that they've got someone in their back corner that they can lean on or mm. that, that will mm. pep them up when they, when they need that support. Mm. Yeah. And that's come up a few times in our discussion, hasn't it? The, the, the ways that we can be, sh be more alert or attuned to opportunities to participate, to, to mm. take that extra step of involvement in our neighbour or our grandchild or our yes. friend. Or, yeah. yeah. Um. Mm. Just want to make a comment just saying that, that particularly in adolescence, you know, I think in our modern thinking and rush, we kind of leave adolescence alone a lot to get on with it. 
we don't appreciate in adolescence. Adolescence is a period where they need more presence from the mentor, from the adult, as you were saying, Clarence, mm. before. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's a that's a, a re, that's something as a as a village that we need to consider. Adolescents mm. want you sitting and taking interest in what they're mm. doing too. Mm. They won't let you know that. They won't let you know that. They do. Yeah. Yeah. They do. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Go away, go away. Yeah. 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 They want you. Yeah. They want it's that you. one time when yeah. they do yeah. want you there and yeah. you're going, totally. oh no, they don't want my attention but they actually do want you. Yeah. 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 Just remember that, Will. Thank you. Remember that, Will. You have to deal with that. You want you there but they're soaking it up. You are always wrong. Adolescence is always about, you come in mid-sentence. If someone says, what's adolescence like? You've come in mid-sentence and you have no idea what they're talking about, <laughs> but you uh. have to support the idea. <laughs> yes, dear. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. Well, let's, we'll go. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. We have another question come in from our audience. There is much talk about the importance of building resilience. Does that mean that we should be letting our children fail to learn through those experiences? Or should we jump in and support them as much as we can? I'm looking left. I'm looking right. <laughs> Well, it's, a, it's about balance, mm, that yeah, one, isn't yeah. it? About, yeah. um, <coughs> let, you know, help allowing kids to fail in a safe way in, in, uh, according to their own abilities and their age and so forth and they learn to deal with failure. Mm. But it's uh, you know, not about letting them loose to mm. kind of fend for themselves. It's doing it in a loving, sort of contained way mm -hmm. uh, and getting mm. that right balance. Mm. Mm. It's, it's making them also understand... Um, with my students, I tell them that I need you to fail. You have to fail because if you don't <coughs> fail, you can't replicate. If you yeah. if you keep getting it right and you don't know how you did it, it's a fluke. But if you replicate, you can give me eight shows a week. You know, if you replicate, and so for me, it's taking the negativity out of the idea of failure and telling yes. a child you have to fail. Mm. You know, because if you don't fail then everything's a fluke and you can't repeat that. Yeah. You can get close to it or you can make a shape that's sort of like it, but at the end of the day, the cake will not be the same because you didn't put the right ingredients in. Mm. So, you know, if you, with a, as, as a parent, as a father of eight, it's always about you have, to, you have to be there, you have to be present, but you have to allow them mm. to, you know, and, you, and at the end of it, you can't say, I told you so. Mm. You have to go, no. and you have to either sit there with the process and go, well, what happened there? Mm. You know, we lost. I said, all right, but, you know, well, we did now. Well, you know, we're going to still go and have mm. something to eat after this. Mm. Yeah. I says, look, mm. there, there, you know, that, that, that will hurt you, but you have to understand that we've got to come around and go, why was that? We didn't practice enough. Mm. Exactly. Yes, that's mm. the so learning. So next time, mm. says, yeah, next time, mm. I don't want, and all you have to do is go, I, you don't want to, you know, remember this feeling. Because mm. when you remember this feeling, you don't want to feel this again. And that's going to motivate you to do X, Y, and Z. Mm. You know, the amount of times I've done rehearsals or auditions where I sort of know the lines, but I don't. And then I get really uppity when they don't cast me. <laughs> I go, how dare you? <laughs> I almost knew what I was talking about, you know. <laughs> but then when you go out there and you actually nail a character or you nail uh, an audition and they still don't cast you, you have to understand that they weren't looking for me. You know, mm. I, I can live with that. They were looking for somebody taller, shorter, wider, mm. whatever. And, mm. and so, in, and in this case, you go, it's okay to fail. It's, it's yeah. all right, you know. I think talking about uh, the importance of role modelling, I guess we can mm. role model our own successes, but this is where role modelling our own failures mm. yeah. is perhaps such mm. an important thing. Are we mm. willing Jeez. to actually share and make ourselves vulnerable about our own failures? Yeah. Um, yeah. Thing I was listening to a podcast uh, this, this weekend, uh, just going by, and I, I wish I knew her name, but it's a lady who made spandex. <laughs> so oh, yeah. I can't remember her name, and oh, I wish yeah. I did. I feel really bad for this. But um, she said every time she came home of a day, um, her father would say, what did you fail at today? Uh, so to get used to, I guess, you know, quite often, I guess, shelter children or young people yeah. about, I guess, the, 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 the <coughs> notion of being scared of failure and putting your hand up and going, oh, I'm going to get it wrong, yeah. or rather her father was saying, have a go, yeah. because yeah. failing, mm. what did you learn from that? Yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah. and don't be scared of it. Don't feel down mm. about yeah. the fact that you failed. Mm. Feel empowered that you've learned mm. something that's mm. going to grow you on the next time you try mm. something else or that same yeah. thing. Yeah, there's that old saying of... Nobody can make you feel inferior without your permission. Mm. And it's the same yeah. thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, I failed, but I'm going to get better mm. next time. Mm. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll go on the next part she said of that. She said, so what she purposely does once a week is does something to make herself feel so embarrassed 
that she can feel that feeling that uh, she doesn't have to worry about failing. So she will sing wow. a song in an elevator in front of a crowd of people. <laughs> oh. She will purposely uh, <laughs> <That's a bit laughs> in front of people just so people have to laugh at her so oh, she feels the crazy. feeling going, that wasn't so bad oh. because they didn't make me feel bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah, so she yeah. purposely... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, was like, I thought it might have been spandex for Are you going to try that? So. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I we'll see we'll find out later. I'm <laughs> not that I'm good at it yeah. like you, James. Yeah. I think we've probably just got time for one or two more questions. We've got another question coming in here. Children do best in families who capably and lovingly care for them, including kids in out-of-home care. But sadly, there is a shortage of foster carers. Mm. How can we as a community support suitable people mm. to be foster carers for children mm. and teenagers? And how can we help both the children and foster carers to thrive? I'm turning to Kerry here for this Thank one, but you. I'm welcome yeah, any input. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, no, we, we one of a, a side branch of our services, we work with children in out of home care and foster carers. And, uh, you know, we know, don't we, how challenging this this world mm. is in foster care and out of home care. And, uh, you know, the challenge is they're the, the neediest children in our community. I think there's a lot we could do to support foster carers more. And I suspect, I'm, you know, I'm not an expert, but I suspect that more people would put up their hand if they felt that given that support. Mm. And I think one of the first things we need to do as part of offering that support is give those foster carers real education about the, the trauma that the child's experience mm. and, and their role and how important their role is, not just as a parent, mm. but almost as a therapist, you know, the relational therapy there. So yep. m the more support we can give people, I think the, m the more people will yeah. step up. And I know it's... I think it's hard these days though, because, you know, yeah. for financial reasons, both parents oh, tend to work, absolutely. you know, and, uh, and so it's not like, if you like the old days where maybe mum was at home yeah, and you, yeah. you, you know, you could take in extra kids and I think people feel, I think families, parents feel very pressured just getting through the yeah, day, absolutely. getting yeah. getting their kids to school, getting themselves to work, you know, there's a lot to do so I think a lot of people don't feel they've got that spare capacity no. so mm. I think mm. I think it's a very, very tough time mm. and, mm. and I, I agree with you Kerry, if, they were, if there was a sense of there is support around you, maybe enough financial support that meant that mm. you didn't both need to work. Mm. Absolutely. You know, yeah. like maybe we need to go that far and uh, uh, and really make it possible for, for people mm. if, if they're that way inclined and they've got mm. the abilities mm. to yeah. care for kids who, who need a family to live with. I'm mm. a family of five and once we were all <coughs> into our later adolescence, my parents became foster carers, right. uh, initially yeah. short term yeah. overnight yeah. care, yeah. emergency yeah. care yeah. and then yeah. towards, yeah. towards longer term and that was yeah. a stage of their life where they were able to do it. Yeah. Uh, so that way again really worked for that window of, of life for them. Yeah. Um, mm. yeah, to offer that support. Yeah. And it's also, are, yeah, yeah. Sorry, it, it's also about education. It's also about understanding that these aren't broken children. You know, these, you know, this child was grown in darkness, so they only know darkness. Mm. You know, it's not yeah. the nature of the child itself. It's always, it's the nurture that mm. happens around them. And yeah, people every, are scared. They're yeah. a bit scared that they're, they'll be out of their depth, maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And all yeah. the child And often they are. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and sometimes they are. To I mean, that. Yeah, when, to I was, when I first got married, yeah. we, we did some respite care, foster care for yeah. short term periods. And um, it was incredibly rewarding. Mm. And uh, but uh, you know, it's, it's. I guess people need to understand there are different ways you can help. Mm. They don't. You know, it doesn't have to be just mm. one type of foster mm. foster caring. Yep. Oh, yeah, yep. that's, right. that's what that very short term or overnight stay yeah. can be a really nice There's trial or dipping in. That's right. Correct. There are many levels yeah. of needs. So this is a good, good, good question here around the importance of children having a voice. How can, how can we ensure that children have a voice in what happens in our community, Clarence? I mean, uh, uh, you know, like this takes us back to, uh, I guess, our youth group. And, you know, one of the first things we do you know, in our first sessions of the year is what do you guys want? You know, we, we ask them. And I think that's, you know, mm. part of the thing. But I think, and I find a lot of the time is they don't give you quite an answer. They're like, I don't know, just give us something to do, you know. Just help, you know, just, just give us some, something fun to do. But it's like, you know, what can we do to help and support you? Um, and I guess it's... It's sometimes, you may, you know, it's, yes, you ask the first time, but not be until the second, third or fourth time. And, and I guess it's not yeah. giving them just one, the one opportunity that, oh, we've asked you, but we're now going to go, we're going to move on. No, it's like, well, let, let's continue to have that conversation. Let's continue to build that relationship. And when you're ready, you will actually tell us what you, what you want. So I think 
finding opportunities where young people like um, Dia, you know, mm. to have a voice mm. in a forum yep. to, to say something or, um, you know, where there's an opportunity, you know, if it is through, through social media, you know, they so happily jump on social media, but, you mm. know, where in schools can they have a voice to voice mm. how they feel and what they mm. think they may need? Kids have got a lot to say. You mm. give them a chance mm. to uh, mm. get involved and have and voice their, their views, they, they mm. have an amazing mm -hmm. amount to, to, mm. to tell us. We just have to be prepared to listen to mm. them and, yep. uh, you know, to take them seriously, show them that respect, that we value what mm. their mm. opinions are. Mm. I think part of that is, is, is timing and place. So where they feel comfortable that they're not going to be judged yeah. on what they say mm. yeah. and that I guess it's, it's the right time when they, should, they want to speak up because it may not be an issue at that current point in time, but it's an issue now. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. But we've got to constantly encourage that because unfortunately with social media there are huge examples of children being shouted down all you need to do is you know look at America with the gun laws or mm. that act that young activist who you know mm. said you know said exactly what you know they were thinking and they went how dare you all grown men you know jumped mm. online mm. and and just trashed her for doing mm. that and mm. so it is very much about communities and 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 grown-ups growing up and, yeah. and listening to this child because, mm. yeah. you know, at the end of the day, they will be leaders of tomorrow. Mm. Mm. That's right. Mm. Mm. Yep. We have time just for one more question here. New York Times columnist David Brooks cites two key strengths of a village approach to family. The increased resilience to hardship and the, their socialising force whereby multiple adults teach children right from wrong how to behave towards others, how to be kind. In bringing tonight's discussion to a close, how can we recreate this concept of a village and what do you see as the main actions and takeaways from tonight's discussion? If I might extend that question obviously to all of us, we could all just have a very brief sort of summary to sort of to point to that. Um, yeah. Start over um, oh, look, Will, I think what we're doing with Connected Mobs is something that can be certainly recreated in, 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 in for all people. Mm. Um, finding opportunities where, I guess, in, in a local community sense that there's an opportunity where people can come together and have you know, as you do see down in DY Foreshore and, and along the strand there, people coming down, having a barbecue and meeting other people and, and not being shy on the fact of saying hello. I think Jay said it before, you know, but not being shy to say hello to the person who's next to you, who you've maybe seen at the, you know, mm. passing at the next shop. Um, but, you know, the fact you may have never actually seen them before and going, g'day, how are you going? How's mm -hmm. your day? Um, Mighty Lois Burke, um, a, a really tr true person to that. You, you'll see her in Woolworths and I was there one time and she just said g'day to this bloke and had a, a good old yarn. And I walked away and I said, oh, so how do you know him? Oh, I don't. <laughs> I just met him. And I was like, you just asked him about his children, <laughs> you asked him about his dad, you asked him his job was for the day, you said yeah. what he was having for dinner. And yeah. I said, those are the type of things you don't ask people. <laughs> but she's like, no, 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 I just want to see how he was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. be open. Well, mm. uh, one of the things that I um, feel very strongly about is uh, parents with, with teenagers. Like often there's a sense of community in primary school where the kids are yes, little, uh, yeah, you yeah, kind of yeah. you get to go to the school and you hang out. And you, well, high school you're much more distant, mm. and mm. I think that there needs to be more work done to bring the parents of teenagers mm. together, mm. That for the school to create the environments, maybe to replicate some of what mm. you're talking about, Clarence, where mm. you know really reach out because of course we're all busy and we don't necessarily prioritise these sorts of events but at the end of the day you know so many parents you know when they're dealing with things like drinking and mm. drug taking and other mm. other sorts of things they're worried about they feel alone mm. they mm. don't have a sense of there's others around them mm. working with them mm. you know supporting each other mm. with all the kids in the community mm. we have to recreate that we have mm. to actually take active mm. steps to 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 be together and to so that there are a bunch of trusted adults around yeah. our children mm. that's what we need mm. not not just you know your mm. family you need you actually do need that mm. village especially in those mm. teenage years mm. Mm. that speaks to that question we had about student well-being and our discussion mm. yeah. previously about getting uh, things in schools and not just for the, the students but parents as well or grandparents yeah. or role models you know of, of people's lives well mm. school so. is an obvious place yeah. mm. i mean it doesn't it's not the only place yeah. but the school can do a lot in mm. in collaboration with parents mm. yeah mm. thanks Anne. Yeah, I agree with both of those comments <laughs> profoundly. And I think just picking on, on something else that Anne said before, you know, if we can think about sort of hubs, isn't it? You know, using the school community as a hub and places where people feel naturally comfortable mm. is the, you know, the early childhood health nurse there, is the GP there, as you said, dentist there. Then we create places and where people might 
you know, reach out to each other, have those conversations and, and uh, spend some more time together. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes our planning has let us, do, has let us down in Absolutely. that way. Mm -hmm. And it's a shame in Australia because we've got so much opportunity to use school settings and preschool settings next to schools are just perfect, aren't mm -hmm. they? And then throw in a healthcare centre there and mm -hmm. a coffee shop. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, it's yep. fascinating. I work in the health mm -hmm. department and if you read their facilities guidelines, they they say that all the early childhood nursing centres need to be at the shopping centres. Yep. Mm. But they're not That's there. Where people go. <laughs> mm. yep. Mm. Yep. You know, and then you go to the you go to the mothers group, you go out to coffee. Mm. Yeah. And you know, as you said, mm. that mothers group, you're at you're doing yeah. the, the you're later. doing the MC <laughs> at the you're yep. doing the MC in the wedding. Yeah, I mean, that's so organic and yeah. so lovely, isn't it? Yeah, and then yeah. that group of people staying together. So I, I think the environment mm. would add to what you're talking about in mm. terms of pulling people together. Mm. Yeah. Final thoughts, Joe. Yeah, look, I think at the, at the end of the day, we talk about creating these hubs at schools. We talk about creating these areas where, you know, we can gather together. I mean, mm. at the end of the day, when you look at education and, and children's health and that, I mean, that's a government thing. You know, yeah. and you have to ask the government, do you want to build submarines or do you want to build a better nation? And, at the, you know, why is it that the people with <laughs> the less amount of power have to come up with all the solutions? You know, and, and that's my biggest complaint is simply that mm. they talk about stuff, but they don't do it. Mm. You know, and, and so in the end, this is what we want. We want more money. We want you to invest in our children because if, you know, you're not willing to invest in us, then why should we invest in you? And yeah. And so... You know, these are all great ideas and these ideas will work, but it comes down to having people at the top because success comes from the top, failure comes from the top. And it comes from those people at the top who are talking the talk but not walking the walk saying, okay, we will invest in paying our teachers what they deserve and it's still not enough. Mm -hmm. we, we will invest in education, both state and private. We will actually do common sense things like you know, people who have trained as psychologists being put into schools, yeah, exactly. you know. Yeah. Um, and, and, and at the end of the day, what you happen is, is that the money that we're using, um, the money that you collect from us will come back to us. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the ways that we're going to start to heal and start to, to, to teach the next generation because I think the thing is, is that the, our government talks about investing in us they need to start, you know, walking the walk. Well, mm -hmm. I, I really agree with you, Jane. I would put it this way in summary, and that is that we all put our children first. This is our mm. value in our families. We, there's no question about that. I think sometimes there's a disconnect when we look at our political leaders. You know, what are their values? Do we see our values reflected in what's talked about um, uh, mm. at that level. We don't often, I think, experience that we're, we're on, the, at, on the same page. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, look, and I think that's the thing, is that I mean, today's Remembrance Day, you know, and I always think to myself, why is it that you're willing to sacrifice our children, but when they come back, you're not willing to look after them? Yeah. You know, let's make a rule then that if you're willing to start wars, you have to join. Or you have to sacrifice your children to come and join. Because then mm. all of a sudden we'll fix this over a cup of tea and a cheeky mm. croissant, you know, because mm. they don't want to do that. But it's quite easy for, for, you know, us to be able to talk. We know the solution because, you know, our children are the only ones that will take our names on. My surname will be taken by my children. My father's name will go through history because my children's children's children. It's, that's the simple, you know, nature of it. And... Mm -hmm. My goal as a parent is that I want to make sure that when I leave this earth that my child is ready to survive without me. That's mm -hmm. all. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, thank you, Jay, for those closing words. And thanks, everyone, for the time we've had tonight to discuss many things relating to the importance of the community in, in young people and supporting families. Thank you to Anne Hollands, Jay Lagaya, Clarence Brinsma and Kerry Gwynn for joining us. And thanks to everyone for submitting your questions. Sorry if we didn't get time to get to yours. This webinar will be available to view on Council's website in the next week or so, together with all previous forums. Don't forget to check out some of the resources we have available on the Big Ideas page on Council's website. We're in the early stages of developing a social sustainability strategy, and the community's involvement is crucial to ensure the strategy represents everyone living on the Northern Beaches. Uh, to that end, we're currently calling for expressions of interest to be part of future engagement activities to develop the strategy, which may include attending community sessions, focus groups or webinars, and completing surveys. 
If you're interested in this, you can register on Council's website to be a part of strengthening our community. Thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you at the next Big Ideas Forum.